Greetings all you lads and ladies and alternative genders out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's part 2 video of the Scratch Built Art Deco Amp series. In this lurid episode we will see the chassis completed both cosmetically and electrically fully wired and tested. If that sounds like a tolerable way to spend the next 20 some odd minutes then pull up an easy chair, grab a beer, and let's get started. Well, I finally resolved the issue of where to put the input jack. I decided to put it back here uh, at the bottom of the uh, cabinet, right in line with the 4 and 8 ohm speaker output jacks. Uh, the input here uh, keeps me from having to drill on the side and detracting from those nice sweep around uh, aluminum trim bars. Also it provides some nice shielding at least on three sides uh, with the metal cabinet and the steel chassis body. Next uh, we're going to design and construct and install a nice a base plate for this and I think it really should be something that does not conduct electricity I'm thinking uh, like either masonite or wood. Well I came up with a way to make the base plate for the chassis. I welded in these four standoffs and then uh, drilled a hole for a number eight screw and welded a nut underneath so there's a captive nut underneath each of these holes then I cut a base plate out of tempered masonite that fits in and recesses into the bottom so you can't see it and then you can put on the rubber feet and use a number eight screw that will go right into that nut in each standoff so it will hold on the feet and hold on the base plate. The parts have arrived and now it's time to lay out all the components uh, on the chassis and then begin cutting all the holes so that the uh, tube sockets, transformers, uh, switches and other things can be installed. As you may recall I intended to go with a Fender VibroChamp chassis but uh, my old friend Ben Prevo in Dublin, Ireland talked me into something a little snazzier and that is how about a Tweed Vibrolux. It's double-ended for more power and it still has a really nice tremolo. So I just couldn't resist. It seemed like a better match for the cabinet after all the work that I've done on it. Uh, I think having kind of an unusual and special uh, amplifier circuit inside that cabinet makes really good sense. Since the Barberlux only has four knobs with a single tone control, uh, I'm going to have an extra pot so I thought why not make a variable negative feedback loop uh, which is adjustable uh, from the front panel. So uh, that's the plan and this is going to be the layout as it stands. The power transformer is going to partially block the cooling fan but let's face it uh, the transformer needs the cooling fan and it might be better not to have cold air blowing on all of the tubes. As it is, it's going to be cooling down the rectifier. And I think there's going to be plenty of air circulating around here to keep things cool. I hope you notice that I did not scrimp on the transformers. Uh, this is about half again more transformer than this circuit needs, both uh, power and output. And I think that's just a good idea. Uh, it's going to make it a little heavier and a little warmer, but uh, I think it's going to pay off uh, big as far as the tone that this beast can create. Also I'm going to tell you a little secret. Uh, another viewer suggested that it be internally illuminated and it's going to be. I've got a little candelabra bulb socket here and I'm going to uh, put in a small light bulb so that uh, the interior of the amp is going to glow through those cooling screens uh, at night uh, and I'm probably going to put in a color that matches the color that I paint the outside of the cabinet. Well, I guess that's about it for the description of what's going to happen and now it's time to make it happen. Uh, I'm going to start cutting and drilling all the holes necessary to mount these components on the chassis. To drill holes in the steel chassis for the tube sockets I use a step bit like this one and beneath it I use a wood piece like this that has been bored out to accept the step bit. 
Then uh, after drilling a pilot hole in the center of where the tube socket hole will be in the metal, I set it underneath here and then just keep progressing the step bit deeper and deeper until the hole is exactly the right size. Okay, all the holes now have been cut and all that remains is to uh, cut out that uh, rectangle for the power transformer. For the transformer cutouts, I make a template out of paper or cardboard that fits the four transformer studs as well as the size and shape of that uh, lower uh, kind of protuberance that will extend down up into the chassis surface. Then using a drill bit of exactly the same radius as the curved corners, you drill out all four corners and then using a saber saw make straight cuts from the outer edge of this hole to the outer edge of this hole and the end result will be a nice rectangular cut with properly radiused corner. Then using the four holes in your template you can mark and drill holes that will allow the transformer studs to pass through the surface of the chassis to underneath where you can put nuts on to bolt the transformer securely to the chassis surface. One little touch that I recommend is to drill a small hole to the side of the pot snout hole so that that little locating pin will have a place to fit in and lock so that the pot cannot rotate and that will orient all five of them exactly the same. Now the power transformer cutout is uh, completed and also some holes for the wires from the controls to pass down uh, underneath the chassis at, to be connected into the circuit. The next step, since I do point-to-point -point wiring, is to rivet in some terminal strips in uh, areas where they're needed. In this case, this will be for all the power supply capacitors and resistors. It's to the outside of the power transformer and therefore shielded from the preamp tubes over here. Okay, I have racked my brain to try to come up with every necessary pass-through hole, screw hole, rivet hole, anything else that could be needed for this chassis. I have my terminal strips uh, riveted in. And now I'm going to paint the top surface here because it'll be visible through the uh, air ducting and I want it to look real nice. Well, here's the chassis all painted. I used a General Motors uh, dark blue metallic acrylic lacquer with two clear coats. So uh, I think it looks really nice out here in the light. It's really pretty. Okay, hope you like it. Well, I've installed all the components on the chassis and uh, everything seems to fit pretty well. Uh, all I need now is the power cord and the two uh, speaker output jacks and the pilot light and it'll be ready to wire. Now all that work is over, the fun is about to begin, which to me is the point-to-point -point wiring, which I thoroughly enjoy. So let's get started. I've been looking for Jack everywhere and the uh, last I saw him he was in the bedroom uh, laying on the bed, but I'm not sure where. Well, I've made some pretty good progress here. I'm probably a little over halfway done with the wiring. Uh, let's review what's been done so far. First, the three filter caps. Now, I put in a giant 500 volt uh, 20 microfarad cap in the first position just to handle any sort of uh, incoming surge of voltage that may exceed the 450 limits of these caps. This is the terminal strip for the bias circuit for the uh, 6V6s. Uh, you can see that the filament wiring is in place. Since the current draw of the 12AX7s is much lower than the 6V6s, I used a smaller gauge of wire just to make things a little neater and, and easier to um, clip onto these uh, tiny little terminals at the back of the 12AX7s. You can see that the primary of the output transformer is all wired. The secondary is passing through here and is going to go up onto the wall where those two speaker output jacks will be located at the rear of the amp cabinet. 
I also welded a master ground lug back here and have attached the center tap for the high voltage, all of the grounds for the filter caps, and also the green uh, grounding wire from the three wire power cord will be connected here. This will pretty well eliminate any chance of AC finding its way over here to the 12AX7s. This is the terminal strip for the uh, components, the resistors and capacitors that are going to connect uh, to all four of the The primary wiring uh, is in place for the power transformer and the wires will come and go through that hole right there below the bottom terminal of the on-off switch. This is the hole for the fan wires which will go down to a rectified a uh, six volt uh, supply which will spin the fan at a lower uh, voltage as several viewers have recommended. You can see that the interior light socket has been wired with tightly wound uh, wire because it's AC and it's going to come over here to the primary circuit where it will pick up its 100, 120 volts of AC power. Here are the output transformer secondary wires which will then connect to the two speaker output jacks which will be at the on the back wall of the cabinet. Now it's time to start wiring all of the uh, control pots. I'm still waiting for the arrival of the uh, NFB adjustable pot uh, which will be installed right here. This is where all the wires will come from beneath the chassis up to communicate with these controls. I'll also be using a lot of shielded cable to eliminate any chance of hum being induced here by the power transformer. Here is that tightly wound wire from the uh, interior light over here to the uh, primary connections for the incoming 120 volt uh, power. And this standoff for that cover plate uh, for the bottom of the chassis also serves as a shield for the uh, input jack. After several days of wiring I believe I'm finished with the chassis. Let's go through it uh, section by section and discuss it briefly. Uh, this should be helpful to those of you who are contemplating perhaps building your own amp from scratch. The three wire power cord comes in through the strain relief. Uh, the black wire goes up here to the switch and fuse and then comes back to the primary side of the power transformer. The white lead from the three wire cord comes in and goes directly to the a white wire of the primary winding. These are the 5 volt directly heated cathode wires and the high voltage uh, wires from the power transformer and here is our high voltage lead that comes over to the first and largest a 500 volt 20 microfarad filter cap. We go through this resistor to our second node, a smaller, this is 20 microfarad at 450 volts. Then through another resistor to the third node, uh, another 20 microfarad filter cap. The fan is 12 volts DC, but several viewers suggested that I just come off of one of the uh, 6 volt filament uh, leads here from, uh, in this case, 6V6 and run into a full wave bridge rectifier. Uh, the AC goes here, DC comes out here with positive at the bottom, and then I put in a 100 microfarad at 50 volt filter cap to smooth the DC output from uh, the full wave bridge rectifier up to the peak value. This way, instead of like about 4.4 .4 volts, I end up with about 5.8 volts. This comes over here and this will be where the fan will attach on the two terminal strips. We get a positive and negative connection here. This is the uh, negative DC uh, grid biasing module right here. I take the uh, bias output from the power transformer, run it through a 1500 ohm resistor through this diode that will only allow the negative uh, waveforms to pass, smooth it with this uh, filter capacitor to ground, and then use a, uh, they say 56K resistor, but I used a lower value resistor here, and then sent it 
over here to a pot for the rest of the resistance to ground. And with this pot I can now adjust to way below and way above the negative 31 volts DC that is recommended as the grid bias voltage. These two 100 ohm resistors form the virtual center tap for the uncenter tapped 6.3 volt winding. Uh, you can see here that it trails uh, from the 6v6s up to the 12 AX7. Now things really get complicated uh, and it's no fun at all trying to wire such a mess here of components to one of these to these puny little 12 AX7 tube bases. What I wish they'd do is make a tube base that the upper part of it that comes through the chassis is the right size for 12 AX7 but that the base is say the size of like a, oh, a quarter or 50 cent piece with the lug so that you can wire easily and have some space. Uh, regardless of all my whining, uh, over here are the three capacitors for the tremolo oscillation loop. You can see here the cathode bypass uh, capacitor and bias resistor here and here for this 12AX7. Um, then the signal will come over here to the second 12AX7 uh, which also serves as a phase inverter and it will then be sent down to the 6V6s for output through the output transformer that is on the other side of the uh, chassis. I use grommets here because there is some uh, current flowing and uh, we want to keep uh, reduce the chances of any sort of shorting to the chassis. Here is the input jack up here somewhat shielded by the floor pan standoff. You see the million ohms to ground which is typical establishing uh, the input impedance and the 68k grid blocker resistor. Before the signal comes through a uh, shielded cable in underneath all of this mass into the grid uh, lead down below. Now for the uh, upper part of the chassis you can see I spray painted a clear bulb here to give us the internal illumination which will match the color of the paint. Um, we've got the primary section here with the on off switch and fuse. Uh, back here are all the pots associated uh, with the volume, a uh, tone uh, the tremolo depth or intensity, the speed, and this is a adjustable negative feedback pot here which can adjust the negative feedback uh, from way below the 56k that they recommend to way above. So we can effectively increase the negative feedback or reduce it almost to zero and this will greatly uh, affect the tone that comes from the amp. This twisted wire is the 6 volts AC for the pilot light which will be mounted up here on the uh, top uh, center of the cabinet. This is not the final tube set that I'll be using in the amp. Uh, these are strictly just tubes that I put in uh, for testing purposes. However, they have been biased and they are balanced. I've got a 7025 in the first position. It serves as a really nice oscillator tube for the tremolo and I've got a 12AX7 in the second position. Uh, this is the output here and I've hooked up a speaker jack to the 8 ohm output. That's the 4 ohm output and what we can do is plug a speaker in and just for fun I'll switch this on and see if it works. One of my main goals back when I used to restore vintage motorcycles was to uh, upon completion have them start like on the first or second kick idle about right and run great. Uh, in other words, everything had to be done exactly right uh, to make that happen. And now with scratch built amplifiers, my goal is the same. So let's see how this one either meets or falls below my expectations. Plugged it in here to a current limiter. I've connected to an 8 ohm uh, shop speaker and I'm injecting a 300 cycle per second tone in over here to the uh, input. If all goes right, uh, when the amp uh, warms up, we really shouldn't hear much of anything, maybe a slight power hum. Um, <clears throat> and then when I turn up the volume, we ought to hear the 300 cycle tone. And then, and this is a real long shot, we'll come over here and try the tremolo speed 
speed and intensity. If anything goes wrong, we'll hear a roaring hum. The uh, current limiter will blind us with its brightness. Uh, smoke will rise and neighbors will file more restraining orders. Okay, get a firm grip on your beer and popcorn. Send the kids to bed. Here we go. Okay, the amp's been warming up for about 15 seconds. Uh, let's turn up the volume and see if we hear the 300 cycle tone. Oh yeah. 300 cycles never sounded so good. Now let's really push our luck and see if the tremolo is tremulating. Oh yeah, perfect. Now the speed control. I substituted a 0.2 microfarad cap for 0.1 in the oscillation loop to slow down the tremolo. And it seems to have worked very nicely. Well, that's it for the maiden voyage. Well, I'm very pleased with the success here in the maiden voyage. Turned it off. Uh, I'm going to have to go in and do some fine tuning here and there. Uh, also rebias it after I put in a, a better match set of 6v6s. But uh, that's about it then for this part 2 video. In part 3 we're going to uh, finish and paint the cabinet. We're going to assemble this in the finished cabinet and then uh, give it a uh, sound check that I hope will please your ears. As usual, I want to thank uh, all my Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors for another month on the air and advertising free. Uh, anyone who would like to join them uh, will please look for links in the video description which will help you do so. Uh, meanwhile, uh, let's go uh, for a trip to a recent car show for a little change of pace. And after that, uh, please stay tuned. I've got uh, at least two or three more videos on the way that I hope you'll enjoy. I'll see you then. guess it's a big day for 55 Chevys. I like the louvered hood. Five-spoke wheels are always nice. You know, I'm not a huge fan of the two-tone interior, and the Chevy insignias are a little over the top, I think. But the dash is beautiful. Very nicely done overall. Real nice car. Straight as an arrow. Well, here's a real low dollar gem, okay? An SS, either 396 or 427 Camaro convertible, which adds about 50% to the price. Look at that shifter. You know this thing must haul ass. The only thing I don't like is it's the modern trend to use these giant wheels with kind of O-ring tires, which to me seem like way too modern a wheel. It just doesn't suit the car. It doesn't look like a neat old fast car. It looks like somebody trying to be cool. Okay, I just can't buy those wheels and tires. But what a car. You know this thing would be fun to drive. If you like El Caminos, and who doesn't, although this is a GMC, uh, what a nice color arrangement here. It says 400 on the front, and I have no reason to doubt that. Cowl induction. Jeez. Looks like uh, just nice clean stock interior. Must be automatic. Beautiful car. I'm a huge fan of 1933 and 34 Fords, and this is a beauty. Pearlescent white, salt flat wheels, they're real high dollar, and those are polished. Magnificent engine. Let's take a look inside. Chop top. Oh, I like it. Look at the gray with the piping. Nice door panels. Steering wheel, dash, this is a first class car. Absolutely gorgeous. Here's a rear view of that pearlescent board. The fact that the fenders appear to be molded in to the body makes me think it must be fiberglass, but still, 
just slick as they come. Look at that kind of apron at the rear. I think I'd be willing to go for a ride in this one. Now here's today's e example of wretched excess, okay? Your nice black Willis gasser, your blown big block. I don't notice any pucker marks on the seat. I think there'd probably be some. What a beast. I don't know if those gauges were green to begin with or turned that way due to the G-forces. Really nice. Kind of a street gap. One of my favorite cars when I was a youngster, a uh, 67 Camaro. Just stone stock, 327 and a convertible to boot. Nice, I think they, I know Pontiac call this color Mayfair Maze. It's got the, probably hubcap, uh, wire wheels, nice stock interior, got the optional wood wheel. What a nice cruiser, huh? Beautiful car. Now this gem, as if the color and condition weren't enough, check out the Z28. Another high dollar gem from the distant past. Four speed, beautiful original stock looking interior. Oh sweet, 302. Cold air induction, headers. God, what would you have given to have this back in like 1970 or so? This is a 69. Back, you're a kid, it's 1970, you got your father's uh, credit card for gas and a semi good looking girlfriend, and you're on the way to the drive in movie. It, life would, and if your Camaro was in the shop, you could always switch over to your 396 Chevelle. So if you want to get to the movie in a real hurry, look at that beautifully detailed 350 horsepower version. Just spectacularly nice. I like the red color. It sort of says, give me tickets, I don't care. And I'm sure they would. I never had any trouble getting those tickets with a yellow car. Look at that. Nice, huh? Now for the Mustang fans, and you know who you are. Here's a nice white one. Okay, fastback, a 289. I wonder if it's the 271 horsepower, the what, K1 version? Nice wheels, my favorite. The American five spokes, kind of satin spiders in the middle. Look at that, and that. Nice steering wheel. About the only change from stock, I would say. But these fastbacks, I know they bring big money. And uh, are really held in high esteem by Mustang fanciers. This is a nice one. Ah, here's today's entrant in the don't mess with me or I'll kick your ass category. Look at the spoke front wheels, which I dearly love. The engine sitting up high with the ghetto blaster headers single four barrel really all you need get the straps holding that just the top part of the hood on no side panels little suggestion for all of us I guess it's fiberglass huh sure looks nice get a front end suspension what is it about the chop top that just just throws a massive finger at the world? I love it. Oh, and some nice small bicycle tires in the rear. Probably easy to spin. Got the old cockroach egg gas tank back there, which isn't my favorite, but that's the way they were stock. Kind of a odd-looking rear bumper. 
but but the front 98% of it is fantastic. Beautiful car.